pleasure to have you. Well, th thank you very much, and I note that a lot of your readers have come to our site, and I appreciate it. Yeah, we, well, we've got some, some great readers, and they're interested in knowing uh, the truth as best they can find it, and uh, we have a, a way of being at our site, which is uh, we really like to keep our facts very separated from our opinions, something I, I really admire that you do as well. Well, thanks. So uh, let's briefly review, you know, if we could just very quickly synopsize, I think you can do this better than anybody. What happened at Fukushima? You know, what, what happened, in, and, and I really would like to take the opportunity to uh, um, talk about this kind of specifically, like, like where we are with each one of the reactors. So, so first of all, th this disaster, um, how did it happen? Was it just, was it bad engineering? Was it, was it really bad luck uh, with the tsunami? How did, this, how did this even initiate? Something we were told again and again, something that couldn't happen, seems to have happened. Well, the, the one little bit of physics here is that even when a reactor shuts down, it continues to churn out heat. Now, no, now only 5% of the original amount of heat, but you know, when you're cranking out um, millions of horsepower of heat, 5% is still a lot. So you have to keep a nuclear reactor cool after it's shut down. Now, what happened at Fukushima was um, it, it went into what's called a station blackout. And, and people plan for that. Um, they, uh, that means there's no power to anything except for batteries. And batteries can't turn the massive motors that are required to cool the nuclear reactor. So the plan is in a station blackout that somehow or other you get power back in, um, in four or five hours. Um, that didn't happen at Fukushima because the, um, the, the tidal wave, the tsunami, was so great that um, it overwhelmed their, their um, diesels and it overwhelmed something called service water too. But in any event, they couldn't get any power to the big pumps. Now, was it foreseeable? They were prepared for a seven-meter tsunami, about 22 feet. Um, the tsunami that hit was, was something in excess of 10 and quite likely 15 meters, so somewhere between 35 and 45 feet. They were warned that the tsunami that they were designed against was too low. They were warned for at least 10 years, and, and I'm sure there were people back before that. So. Would they have been prepared for one this big? I don't know, but certainly they were unprepared for um, even a tsunami of lesser magnitude. So the tsunami came came along and just swamped the systems. And uh, I, I heard that you know there were some other design elements there too, such as potentially there there were um, the generators were were in an unsafe spot, or that maybe some of their electrical substations all happened to be in the basement. Um, so so they kind of they kind of got taken out all at once. Now here's what I heard was you know the the, the initial reports when they came out they said oh no, nothing to fear. Um, they all went into scram, which is some sort of emergency shutdown, and and they said everything scrammed. And I knew that we were in trouble within less than 24 hours. They talked about how they were pumping seawater in, which I assume by the time you're pumping seawater, you, you, you have a pretty clear indication from the outside that there's something really quite wrong with this story. Is that true? Uh, yes. Uh, seawater, and um, as anybody who's ever had a boat on the ocean would know, you know, salt water and stainless steel do not get along very well. And salt water and stainless steel at 500 degrees don't get along very well at all. Um, and then uh, you're right, they had some single points of vulnerability, you know, the, the hole in the armor. Um, the diesels were one of them, but even if the diesels were up high, they would have been in trouble because of those service water pumps I talked about. And they got wiped out, and those pumps are the pumps that cool the diesels. So even if the diesels were runnable, the cooling water that runs through the diesels would have been taken out by the tsunami mm -hmm. anyway. So, it's kind of a, a a false argument that it to blame to blame the diesels. Okay, so so take us through. So reactor number one, um, you know, it, it was revealed I think about a week ago now that that they finally came to to the revelation that I think some of us had come to independently uh, that there had been something more than than a, a partial meltdown, maybe even a complete meltdown. What what's your assessment of reactor one and where is it right now? When you see hydrogen explosions, that means that the outside of the fuel has exceeded. 2,200 degrees, and the inside is well over 3,500 degrees. The fuel gets um, brittle, it burns, and then it plops to the bottom of the, um, of the nuclear reactor in a molten blob like lava. Um, it was pretty clear to a lot of people, including apparently to the NRC, but they weren't telling people back in March, that that had occurred in Unit 1, that there was essentially um, 
a blob of lava on the bottom of the nuclear reactor. Now, we've got to separate. There's a nuclear reactor, and that is inside of a containment. So there's still one more barrier here. But the problem is that it, the reactor had boiled dry, and they were using fire pumps connected to the ocean to pump um, salt water into the reactor. Now, if this thing were individual tubes, the water could get around the uh, uranium and completely cool it. But when it's a blob at the bottom of the reactor, it can only get to the top surface. And that would cause it to begin to melt down. Now, on these boiling water reactors, there's about 70 holes in the bottom of the reactor where the control rods come in. And um, I suspect that those holes were essentially the weak link that caused this molten mass. Now it's 5,000 degrees at the center. Even though the outside may be touching water, the inside of this molten mass is 5,000 degrees. Um, it melts through and lays on the bottom of the containment. That's where we are today. We have no uh, reactor, um, essentially a big pressure cooker, um, and the molten uh, uranium is on the bottom of the containment. The, it spreads out at that point because the floor is flat, and I don't think it's going to melt its way through the, the concrete floor. Um, it may gradually over time. But the damage is already done because the containment has, um, has cracks in it, and it's pretty clear that it's leaking. So you're putting water in the top, and the plan had never been to put water in the top and let it run out the bottom. That is not the preferred way of cooling a nuclear reactor in an accident. But you're putting water in the top, it's running out the bottom, and it's going out through cracks in the containment. After touching directly uranium and plutonium and cesium and strontium, and it's carrying all those radioactive isotopes out as liquids and gases into the environment. Yeah. So, so um, I, this melting that happened, is this just a function of the decay heat at this point in time? We're not speculating that there's been any sort of recriticality or any other, you know, nu what we might call a nuclear reaction. This is just decay heat from the uh, isotopes that are in there from, from prior nuclear activity. Uh, those are just decaying and giving off that heat. That's sufficient to get to 5,000 degrees? Yes. Once the uranium melts into a blob at these low enrichments, 4 or 5 percent, it can't make a, a new criticality. If there's criticalities occurring on the site, and there might be because there's still iodine-131, which is an indication, it's not coming from the unit 1 core and it's not coming from the unit 2 core because those are both blobs at the bottom of the containment. All right, so we have these blobs. They, they've, they've somehow escaped the primary um, reactor pressure vessel, which is that big steel thing, and now they're, they're on the relatively flat floor of the containment, the concrete piece. And you say Unit 2 is, is roughly the same story as Unit 1. Um, where's Unit 3 in this story, then? Unit 3 may not have melted through, and that means that some of the fuel um, certainly is lying on the bottom, but it may not have melted through. Um, and some of the fuel may still still look like fuel, although it's certainly brittle. Um, and it's possible when the fuel is in that configuration that um, you can get a recriticality. It's also possible in any of the fuel pools, unit one, two, three, and four fuel pool, that you could get a, a criticality as well. So um, there's been frequent enough um, high iodine indications to lead me to believe that either one of the four fuel pools or the Unit 3 reactor is, um, is in fact, every once in a while starting itself up. And, uh, and then it gets to a point where it gets so hot it shuts itself down, and it kind of cycles, it kind of breathes, if you will. Right, so, but it's, it's, when it's doing that breathing, it's, it's certainly generating a lot of heat uh, through the fission process, and then, of course, it's generating more isotopes to decay and c contribute to decay heat at that point. Um, what, what's your assessment if there is that sort of breathing going on? Is this like a little pocket within one of the uh, geometries that exist that would still allow fission to be supported, or could, could you imagine this being a fairly significant amount, or how much do you think might be happening? I think it's a relatively significant amount. You know, maybe uh, a tenth of the nuclear reactor core mm. starts back up and shuts back down and starts back up and shuts back down. And that's an extra heat load. You know, you're not prepared to get rid of one-tenth of a nuclear reactor's heat mm. by pumping water in the top. Now, Unit 3 has another problem, and the NRC mentioned it yesterday for the first time, and it gets back to that salt water and the effect on iron. They're afraid that the reactor bottom will break, 
literally just break right out and dump everything. Um, because it's now hot and it's got salt on it and it's got the ideal conditions for corrosion. So the, the big fear on Unit 3 is that um, it will break at the bottom and whatever else is, remains in it, which could be the entire core, uh, could fall out suddenly. And if that happens, you can get something called a steam explosion. Um, and this may be a one in a hundred chance. I, I don't want your listeners to think it's going to happen tomorrow. But if the core breaks, you will get a steam explosion. But we're not sure the core is going to break. And that's a that's a violent hydrogen explosion like the one we've already witnessed. Reactor three caught me when when it when it blew because what I saw there with my eyes was was a a fairly focused upwards. Um, very high energy event, which completely looked different from what I saw when when Unit One blew. Um, are you talking about is, is that, or or because I know you've you've postulated in the past that you think that um, if there might have been a what was the name for it a prompt? Yeah, criticality. The, I called it a prompt criticality that created a detonation. And the engineers differentiate. It was a, either way, it's going to be a big explosion. But the violence of Unit Three's explosion. Um, and I did some calculations to show that the speed at which it, the, the, the flame traveled and in order to throw particles as far as this one throw through particles, the speed of that shock wave had to be in excess of 1,000 miles an hour. And, and that's a detonation where the shock wave itself can cause incredible damage. And that can happen if we were to have one of these steam explosions, if the bottom of the reactor on Unit 3 falls out. Um, you could have another one of those all over again. And, and uh, obviously a, a, not a good thing if that happens. What can they do at this stage, though, if that's a concern they have? Uh, uh, this, sounds, this sounds very tricky to me because if it turns out that, that there's excess heat being generated because we're having this breathing um, recriticality event going on in there, but for whatever reason, let's just say the core of Reactor 3 is pretty hot, um, how, what can they really do beyond um, just keep trying to dump water in there and keep their fingers crossed? Um, well, that's two out of the three things they have to do. <laughs> uh, the, the other one is they can flood it if, if they can flood it from the outside. In other words, put water outside the pressure cooker as well as inside the pressure cooker. Um, they may be able to remove more heat that way and prevent the, 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 the gross failure of the, of the pressure vessel. But really, it's just you know hoping that you can put enough water in. And uh, the other piece of that is, and it relates to Unit 4, too, is, um, is a seismic event. Um, if you put too much water in these reactors, they, they get heavy. And they're not designed to sway when they're as heavy as these things have hundreds, of, uh, tens of tons of extra water in them. So they're really not designed to sway. So if there's a severe aftershock, um, unit 3 and, um, and Unit 4 are in real jeopardy. And if you remember the, the Sumatra uh, earthquake, that was a 9-plus about three or four years ago, um, the biggest aftershock occurred three months afterward, and that was an 8-6. So um, aftershocks, uh, even though we're two months into this, um, if the Sumatra event is any indication, aftershocks are still possible. Right, and, and so you mentioned Unit 4 then. Um, also being at risk for this. I, I thought the Unit 4, the, the core was out um, and that the, the, it, they have some water back in the pool. What's the concern with Unit 4 at this point? Um, you're absolutely right. There's no, um, there's no reactor running there. Everything had been taken out and was put in the spent fuel pool. But that means there's no containment either. So the entire uh, spent fuel pool is visible. Literally, when they have those helicopter flyovers, you can look down into this blown out shell of a building and see the, um, the fuel in the spent fuel pool. It's still relatively hot because it only shut down in November. So there's still a lot of decay heat in that pool. Um, Brookhaven National Labs did a study in uh, 1997. And it said that if a fuel pool went dry and caught on fire, um, it could cause 187,000 fatalities. So it's a big concern. Um, and probably the biggest concern, I, I know Chairman Yasko of the NRC said that the reason he told um, the Americans to get out from 50 miles out was he was afraid of Unit 4 catching fire, that, that exposed fuel pool would volatilize plutonium, uranium, and cesium, and strontium. Um, and um, 
and if the Brookhaven study is to be believed, could could kill you know more than a hundred thousand people as a result. Hmm. And and this from the effects of radiation or long term cancer exposures. Something we'll get into in a minute. Yeah, hot particles uh, from long term cancer exposure. Okay. So so we've had these four units. Each of them has sort of had their own crisis, and each of them has has released um, contamination into the environment. First. How much contamination really got released here? Uh, second, you know, we we see that a bunch of it's headed into the ocean, although we're we're still, you know, I think questioning how much is where it all is. So my question is around how much contamination is is around these buildings at this point in time, and and you know what are the challenges, and what happens when not not if but when typhoon season comes up? Say we had a, a sort of a large onshore kind of a storm, you know, would that create sort of issues? I'm just trying to play out how much how much has been released how much might be released and, and what it actually implies at this point in time? Well, this, this event is, um, I've said it's worse than Chernobyl, and I'll, I'll stand by that. Um, there, there was an enormous amount of, um, of radiation given out in um, the first two, two, three weeks of the event. And had the wind been blowing inland, this would be, uh, it could very well have brought the nation of Japan to its knees. I mean, it was... Uh, there's so much contamination that luckily wound up in the Pacific Ocean compared to across the, uh, the the nation of Japan. It could have cut Japan in half. But now the winds have turned, you know, so they're heading to the south toward Tokyo. And, uh, you know, my concern and my advice to, to friends is that if there's a severe aftershock and the Unit 4 building collapses, leave. Um, there's, we're well beyond where any science has ever gone at that point, and uh, nuclear fuel lying on the ground and getting hot is not a, a condition that um, anyone has ever analyzed. So the the, the plants, you'll, you'll see them steaming, and, and as, as the summer goes on, you'll see them steaming less because the air is warmer. But it's not because they're, they're not steaming. You just don't see it because... This event occurred in March, and it was cool there, so you'll see a plume a lot easier. Those um, plants are still emitting um, a lot of radiation, nowhere near as much as on the first two weeks, but a lot of radiation, cesium, strontium, and um, mainly cesium and strontium. Those are going to head south, whether or not there's a, a, a hurricane, tropical hurricane. Um, the wind is going to push it south this time, and uh, so the issue is... Um, not the total radiation you might measure with a Geiger counter in your hand, but um, but hot particles. Well, there was already I, I you know was taken aback when I read the reports that um, in some prefectures right around Tokyo they'd found some what I consider to be pretty hot readings, um, you know three or four thousand becquerels in the soil, one hundred seventy thousand becquerels in in some kind of a fly ash or or they they found some in sludge as well, but I think the higher reading was from some sort of ash, which means it came through an incinerator or, or some sort of burning process. I thought those were pretty shocking levels because uh, I hadn't really been informed that that the winds had shifted south long enough and enough contamination had made it that far in order to get readings like that. So I felt um, uh, fairly confused, as if I, I didn't have a good understanding of how much might have gotten there or how it got there or when it got there, and that they'd found those readings in March, and of course they didn't release the data until uh, sometime in, towards the end of April. Um, did you follow that part, and, and, and what do you make of readings like that? Um, yes, I followed it, and I, I am as confused as you are. Individuals have sent, uh, have sent Fairwind some car air filters from, from Tokyo, and they turn out to be one of the ideal ways of measuring radiation because uh, you know, they trap a lot of these hot particles. And we had one person sent us seven filters, and they ran a body shop or something, and, and Five of the filters were fine, and two were incredibly radioactive. So what that tells me is that the, the plume was not regular. And you'll have places where there was um, not much deposition, and you'll have places where there was a lot of deposition. Um, that same thing happened up to the north, but um, within Tokyo, uh, it seems like wherever the official results were being reported, um, didn't really represent the um, the worst conditions of the plume. And I saw that on Three Mile Island. We shouldn't be surprised that a plume meanders and that a plume um, may miss a, a, a major radiation detector by um, you know a, a quarter of a mile, and it's not detected. doesn't mean it's not there. 
it means we just didn't detect it. Sure, it's, it's this is uh, fluid dynamics. You know, when you when you put a, a drop of dye in a glass of water and watch it swirl around. Obviously, it, it more ends up in some places than others. So that's part of it. And anybody's looked at the uh, the after map of Chernobyl all across Belarus and, and and Ukraine and whatnot. I mean, it's it's obviously not a a big circle. <laughs> it's a very very um, convoluted map of of deposition. So that that's part of it. I guess I was surprised because I hadn't heard of any warning signs that that amount could have been de um, deposited that far south yet and there but there it was so um, that was pretty interesting to me what, what happened there was the plume went out to sea but then curved south and then and then west it actually c came in like a hook um, so that uh, you know when you were measuring what was happening at, at Fukushima it appeared that the plume was heading out to sea but then uh, offshore the winds took it south and then west into into um, Tokyo, um, and it contained, um, the, the particles we're picking up in air filters are you know, strontium and cesium and uh, americium, which is a, 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 an indication of, um, of fuel failures. Right, and maybe that was the same plume that I remember um, uh, was Korea, South Korea, actually shut some schools down because it was raining at the time and they had a lot of radiation coming down. So we know that there was a big south and then west hooking in order for it to get there, so maybe that was... That was part of that that one process, um, but it, it speaks to something, which is that these plumes that are coming up and out of contaminated plumes with radioactive particles in them are, are pretty hot, um, as you might expect. I remember the, the the reactor that was scaring me the most for a while was was number two, which looked sedate. It had this little hole in the side, but it was just it was just constantly emitting steam, constantly, um, for a whole period of time. And I knew what was in that steam. It was uh, it was going to be pretty hot. I thought unit two has gotten to the point where. It can't get any worse because it's now laying at the bottom of the containment, and the containment has a hole in it. That doesn't mean that it's it's not really bad still. It just can't get any worse. Um, the, the concern uh, now is this enormous amount of water that's being used to cool these reactors, you know, tens of tons an hour. And the, the original plan was to recirculate the nuclear reactor water through the nuclear reactor, and on the other side, have a heat exchanger that took the heat away. So you wouldn't generate any water. In fact, we've got hundreds of thousands of tons of radioactive water. And it's not mildly radioactive. And here's the problem. The, um, the, if you were to demineralize this or filter this, the filters and demineralizers would become so radioactive that they, the filters might melt because they're made of a plastic material. And the other part of it is that the personnel couldn't get near the filters to change them. Um, so it's a very difficult problem. What do you do with all of this contaminated water? The large volume and the high radioactivity make, um, make getting rid of that water very difficult. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'd like to talk about the other challenges they face, too. I mean, I, d I don't know what they're going to do with all that water, and I don't think they do either. They're pumping it into a big storage tank right now, and I just read that maybe that's leaking, or at least some water went out of it, so one guess is it's leaking. Um, talk to us about, about what are the other challenges that those engineers and cleanup crews are going to be facing? What, what's the work environment like there right now? Yeah, we are not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the people outside are wearing completely um, enclosed um, clothing taped to their faces, and they have respirators on. Um, the respirators are designed you know, as a charcoal filter, but they're breathing through their lungs, and they're taking the air from the outside through those respirators. Um, it's hot, it's sticky, and you're constantly looking at this radiation gauge, but um, it's something that... Um, while uncomfortable, probably isn't um, isn't lethal. The the people that are going in are are a different problem. Um, they're going in in a, essentially a bubble suit, and um, they have their own self-contained air, like a fireman in a in a fire a Scott air pack is sort of what they're they're called. So they're going in with their own self-contained air into a place that has no lights, into a place that has um, water everywhere, in a place that's dark um, with um, with rubble. And on top of that, it's highly radioactive. And they're probably carrying 30 or 40 pounds worth of gear to do whatever it is they were sent in there for. Um, the stay time in that environment, um, it, it would be tough. If there were no radiation, it's a hot, sticky, pretty mm -hmm. miserable place to work for for an hour or so. 
but the radioactivity levels are so high that these guys are being chased out on the order of you know, 15 minutes. And they're receiving an exposure which is roughly equivalent to um, the, the worst an American worker would get over five years. These guys are picking up in 10 minutes. Mm. So let's assume that, that they do actually have the, I think they've bumped it up to 250 millisieverts. Um, as a, as an annual dose limit now. So so once a worker gets to, say, that, that threshold, then what? Hopefully they, they are no longer allowed to receive any more radiation, um, period, for the not just for a year or for a month, but they, they really shouldn't receive any more than that. Um, here's the, a general rule of thumb is 250 rem um, will, will kill you. So that means that if 10 people get 25 REM, one of them will develop a cancer. And if 100 people get 2.5 REM, one of them will get a cancer. So it doesn't mean lesser, can lesser doses um, assure you of not getting a cancer. So what these people are doing is they're increasing the likelihood that they'll get a cancer. Um, 250 millisieverts is 25 REM, by the way. I'm sorry. Um, but they're increasing the likelihood, every time they pick up that exposure, they're increasing the likelihood that they'll get a cancer by 10%. Right, and, and so, uh, gosh, I read some of the readings that I saw um, in, in there are pretty scary hot readings. Um, so, so they're definitely all the way up um, in the one sievert zone for, for some, of the, some of the areas, and some are hotter and all of that. So, so we've got these damaged buildings. They're sending people in. My concern has been that, you know, there are only so many people who are trained to work in those facilities, so they know them, know them well, knew the systems, know the, know the parts, know how to even navigate the hallways. Um, once they've gone through and used up their allotment of, of radiation um, exposure, I, 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 they're done, right? And then I guess they train the next people to go in. And uh, one thing that's concerned me is I know that when Chernobyl went, uh, you know, Russia it just threw hundreds of thousands of people at it um, in small little bits and, and to clean that up. Here we're seeing a very different response. It's much more measured. Um, they're relatively small teams by my eye. I, I, I look at satellite photos. I don't see hundreds of thousands of people converging on that. Um, I see uh, a pretty focused response. Uh, how long is it going to take with a focused response like that um, to get this job done, do you think? The, the Russians needed thousands of people because large fragments of the fuel had fallen on the surrounding farmland. So literally, people would pick up a fragment in a wheelbarrow and uh, and run toward where the reactor was, uh, throw that fragment into the reactor pit, and they were they were done. They had received their lifetime exposure. Um, in in this case, um, the, while the the radiation is not contained, um, it's not coming out of solid particles that can get picked up. It's coming out of liquid. So it's a the, the Woods Hole has already said that uh, um, the ocean has 10 times more radiation from, uh, from Fukushima than the Black Sea did from, um, from Chernobyl. So the, the Chernobyl reaction with a large staff of people it was because it sort of blew up. And the Fukushima reaction, while it did blow up, a lot of it is going down, and we're just beginning to deal with it. They're, they're importing workers from the U.S. already, and I suspect they, they, um, they will again. I was in the business. I, as a vice president, I would hire people to work in very high radiation zones. Then we would train them for uh, two or three weeks in a mock-up, and then they'd have three minutes in a high radiation zone to do what we trained them for. And that would be their, their yearly exposure. And We'd give them a check and say, thank you very much. See you next year. Um, and that's what will happen here at, at, uh, at Fukushima. So talk to us about, um, realistically, uh, I, I mean, this is going to be months, years, whatever. It's going to take a long time. Uh, what do they do at this point? Are they going to entomb these things? Do they have to, are they required to just keep dumping water on these things until they finally cool down, capturing water all the way through? Or is there, is there some way that they can maybe just throw up their hands and, and just pour a bunch of concrete on this and call it a day? I think eventually they may get to the point of, throwing up their hands and pouring the concrete on. They can't do that yet because the cores are still too hot. Is there, is there some way that they can maybe just throw up their hands and, and just pour a bunch of concrete on this and call it a day? I think eventually they may get to the point of throwing up their hands and pouring the concrete on. They can't do that yet because the cores are still too hot. 
So we're going to see the, the dance we're in for another year or so until the cores cool down. Um, at, at that point, there's not uh, anywhere near as much decay heat, and you probably could consider filling them with concrete and just letting them sit there like we have at, at Chernobyl as a, as a giant mausoleum. That would work for units one, two, and three. Um, unit four is still a problem because, um, again, all the fuel is at the top. You can't put the concrete at the top because you'll collapse the building. And it's so radioactive, you can't lift the nuclear fuel out. And um, you know, I used to do this as a living, and, and, um, and Unit 4 has me stumped. Hmm. So what do they do, do you think? I think they'll be forced to build a building around the building. And then, because you need heavy lifting cranes, uh, cranes that lift 150 tons, which are massive cranes, um, to put the nuclear fuel into, um, into canisters, which then can can get removed. Um, that's sort of what happened to TMI, but all of the fuel at TMI was uh, was still at the bottom of the vessel. But it was a three-year process to get the molten fuel out of, out of Three Mile Island. Four years, actually. So um, the problem here is that all of the cranes that do that have been destroyed, on, on at least on units one, three, and four. So and you can't do it in air. It has to be done underwater. So my guess is they'll have to build a building around the building um, to provide enough shielding and, and water so that they can then go in and, uh, and put this fuel into a, a heavy lift, lift canister. Okay. All right. I hadn't, I hadn't considered that. That's a great insight. So let me summarize here. We have, we have these four reactors. Three of them have melted through. Um, one of them is... is uh, uh, unit 4 is probably one of the more dangerous ones in, in the sense that um, it's going to be years to build a building around it. It's going to be years until uh, really the situation is contained. And, and in Unit 4, though, we're, we're still concerned that in the year or two or however long it takes to, to build a building and sta really stabilize that, another aftershock could come along. Or uh, in the case of Unit 3, uh, if another aftershock comes along and um, you know, the, the pressure vessel is full of water, there's, there's a chance here that we could see um, some other event. Some, you know, that this, this situation is not yet fully stabilized in the sense that there are still surprises uh, to be found. It's surprising where the water shows up. There might still be some surprises um, left in and how the buildings behave or, or, or systems uh, hold up or fail. What else would you add to that summary? The groundwater. Uh, I am very concerned that I am hearing nothing about groundwater monitoring. We know the ocean, we know there have been leaks into the ocean. Uh, I'm not convinced that there's not cracks in the structures that are allowing this highly radioactive water to get into the groundwater. And I've been talking to people in Japan, and my recommendation there is that they should build a, a moat all the way around the reactor, about down to bedrock, which is 60 feet or 20 meters, and about uh, four and a half feet wide, which is a, <clears throat> a meter and a half wide, and fill it with a material called zeolite. And it, it, it's a very good absorber of radioactive material, and it would prevent the outward migration of any of this radiation. Um, that's not happening, and I don't understand, um, I don't understand why. So you know, we look at the buildings, and we look at stopping the, the heat and the radiation that's going upward. But there's an enormous amount of, of radioactive material in the soil right now. And um, you know, one of the prefectures nearby uh, had radioactive sewage sludge. And um, someone who watched our site is an executive in a uh, sewage business, and he said it's not uncommon after an earthquake for groundwater to infiltrate a sewage system. And that frightened me a lot, because if the groundwater is already contaminated out in these uh, prefectures, um, it could be um, the, the serious problem that is receiving no attention right now. So um, how, how, generally speaking, do you have a sense of how fast groundwater migrates? I mean, is this something that, that will be, you know, three miles away from the plant in um, 10 years or in 10 weeks? Um, what, how, how big of a problem is this immediately? Uh, I don't think it's an immediate problem. Uh, but I do think unless, um, uh, and, uh, unless mitigated pretty quickly, it can become an immediate problem. You know, it moves slow, but... If, if, if it's already out of the barn, um, it's going to be harder. The further out you have to build this trench, of course, the bigger the trench has to be. 
Um, so my goal is to, is to trap it near the source rather than let the, let the horse get too far from the barn. Okay, well, th thank you for that. Um, what I